for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Paul Stonick. He's the vice president of SCAD Pro at Savannah College of Art and Design's in-house design and research and innovation studio, where they focus on generating new ideas and products for the world's most influential brands, from prestigious Fortune 500 names to private and public small and mid-cap companies, including Google, Amazon, Apple, NASA, Delta, BMW, Volvo, Uber, Mayo Clinic, The Home Depot, P&G, and Chick-fil-A, to name a few. With over two decades of Tradigital, and we'll talk about that brand creative visual and UX design experience and nearly 20 years of creative team leadership, Paul's delivered award-winning, delightful, and compelling experiences for brands of all sizes across various industries. His work's been featured in multiple news outlets, research organizations like Forrester and Gartner, national television spots, and in multiple Apple keynotes. On the show today, we get to know Paul a little bit more, a new book that he uh, contributed to uh, related to music and his early brushes with music celebrities. We talk about what he's doing at SCAD Pro and the Savannah College of Art and Design as a creative university. Talk about some of their partnerships and the type of work that they've done to date. And then we talk about how design needs to be integrated into the top ranks of businesses, how to think about that, what are the ingredients needed to create that opportunity. And we end on the conversation around this group that he's involved with called Punks and Pinstripes. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Paul Stonick. Well, Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alan. Pleasure to be here. And thank you for having me. Yeah, no, I'm excited about this conversation. Before we get into your role and background and all that kind of stuff. I hear you've got a new book that you helped contribute to. Tell me that's, about that. Yeah, that's correct. I had the opportunity to contribute to a book about my second favorite band of all time, NXS, who were popular in the 80s and 90s. And NXS and the publishing company had asked fans for stories about what the music meant to them and what the band meant to them in their lives. And their music had a huge impact on me and was really the soundtrack of my high school and college years. And I still listen to them every single day. Uh, They apparently liked my story and asked to publish it, but they were also excited about the memorabilia I had collected over the years, including original album cover art, tour poster art, autographs, tour jackets, tour books, concert shirts, passes, picks. I became friendly with the head publisher of the book, This Day in Music, and I helped with a lot of the socialization of the book. And to my surprise, they gave me a credit and an acknowledgement in the book, along with a handful of other contributors. So I think that's pretty cool. And so for somebody who's been a fan for about 40 years, that's a great highlight. So it comes in three versions, super deluxe, deluxe, and standard, and all are available on nxs.com for purchase. I love that. I love that. And I mean, not to go into two stories about yourself, but you are, you've had brushes with musical celebrity throughout your life, it seems like. So yeah, in excess, but opening for the Chili Peppers had to be something unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, that was really just being in the right place at the right time. Uh, I was in a college band. I mean, we were this cover band that you weren't very good. We were called Split Image, but you were in the right place at the right time. And Red Hot Chili Peppers came to play at Drew University where I went to school. And they needed an opening band. And so the manager of our band, who was also the campus manager of the university center, had reached out to us and said, hey, Chili Peppers need an opening band. And we're like, of course we'll do it. And this was, <laughs> this yeah, was of course. It's like, that's a no brainer. But this was before they broke big. This was before Under the Bridge and mm. Blood Sugar Sets Magic had come out. So they were known, but they weren't huge yet. So we caught that right before they broke. And it was something I'll never forget. I mean, they were out there playing basketball and hanging out. I mean, they were crazy. And we just, we had an absolute blast doing that. So it's my claim to fame. I wish there were video (laughs) of it, but there isn't any video because we're talking 1990. So, (laughs) you know, it was, uh, it was an amazing experience and I'll, I'll never forget it. Well, yeah, I mean, it's kind of amazing if, if I just think about it myself, I mean, I grown up in the nineties myself and, and it's, uh, you had Red Hot Chili Peppers. I think my my equivalent of in excess would would be Pearl Jam. <laughs> like I probably still listen to Pearl Jam songs every day. But uh, yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable. And uh, well, from those 
early musical roots to now you're the vice president of SCAD Pro at the Savannah College of Art and Design. Tell me a little bit about like, where did you get your start in your career and how did you end up where you are? Yeah, absolutely. I have over two decades of what I like to call tradigital experience in brand creative, visual, you can write that down, visual and UX design. Uh, I started in web design in the mid 90s, back when the magic was written. And then I pivoted to UX design in 2012. Uh, 18 years in e-commerce, fashion, beauty, home improvement, automotive, banking, entertainment, uh, 15 years in executive design leader roles. I worked for a small company called The Home Depot. You probably heard of it. Um, <laughs> leading a team for the fifth largest e-commerce site and for a mobile app where we helped grow the revenue from three, over three years from $700 million to $2 billion. Uh, I've led teams for the last 17 years. And I like to say some of my greatest work will never appear in my portfolio because it's the teams I've built and the leaders I've helped develop over those 17 years. And I have a proven track record of leading world-class in-house creative teams. I've delivered award-winning work. My work's been featured in news outlets, research organizations like Forrester and L2 Gardner, National Intelligence Spots, and multiple Apple WWDC keynotes. And after 20 years in large corporations, I was part of this entrepreneur exodus and joined an automotive startup leading design and product. Uh, we were acquired by a larger automotive company. And after the win of being acquired, which was a great day, most of us were laid off just a few months later, which was really the beginning of the tech layoffs last year. So that put me in a weird spot. And as I started to think about act three of my career, what was I going to do next? And you know, I had a relationship with SCAD for about five years in different capacities. So whether that was hiring interns, doing UX masterclasses, career days, or engaging in a SCAD pro while I was there, they saw my post about getting laid off and approached me about running SCAD Pro. And frankly, that was the most interesting and inspiring opportunity that was out there. And as I thought about Act 3, I said, yeah, grooming the next generation of design leaders further up in the funnel at the higher education level, that's really meaningful and exciting work. Yeah, no, it, it's amazing. And Savannah College of Art and Design, I mean, maybe, maybe just describe the college, and then I would love for you to talk a little bit more about SCAD Pro, the program that you're leading. Yeah, absolutely. You know, Savannah College of Art and Design was founded in 1978, and it's an amazing school where we have over 17,500 students, and career preparation is woven into every fiber of the university, uh, resulting in a superior alumni employment rate. In a recent study, 99% of SCAD graduates were employed pursuing further education or both within 10 months of graduation. Uh, we don't consider ourselves to be an art school. We're a creative university preparing students for their creative profession. So we have locations in Savannah, Atlanta, Lacoste, France, and then through an online program called SCAD Now. Mm, that's amazing. And, and so SCAD Pro within SCAD, if you will, tell me a little bit about the program and, and what, who, like, what, what are you guys doing and who do you serve, if you will? Yeah, there, there's really two parts to that answer. First, we serve the students and SCAD Bs. They come first, second, and third as we prepare them for their creative professions. And, and the work that we do at SCAD and SCAD Pro is really at the intersection of art, design, and business. We're a creative university, like I said, and career preparation is woven into every fiber of the university. And SCAD Pro is the university's collaborative innovation studio that generates business solutions for the world's most influential brands. We're working with companies like Google, Chick-fil-A, Delta, Disney, Coca-Cola, Ford, BMW, NASA, Amazon, Deloitte. I mean, the, the list goes on and on. And while we encourage SCAD Bs to be creative and think big, we strive never to forget the needs of the client or the product or the service and user. And that's part two of the answer is that 45% of our partners are from Forbes top 100 most valuable companies. And to date, we've done over 700 partnerships and over 70 products have been launched into market. That's amazing. And what does a, how do you engage, if you will? Like, what is a, is it a project team? How does that take shape? Yeah, we have a business development team that I run. And so we have account leads that are reaching out to these businesses and developing networks and relationship where we extend our services to these companies and say, here are the types of products that we offer. Sometimes they'll come in through alumni connections. Sometimes they'll come in through faculty collections or word of mouth. They'll come in through prospective students and prospective parents as well, too, on a SCAD day. Uh, during open house. So there's really a number of channels where companies come in, but we do see a high recurring return rate of current clients that come back to us over and over because we're delivering value to them in terms of new ideas, creativity, and innovation. I love it. I love it. And maybe how, maybe you could describe a project or two just to give it a little bit more context. Yeah, absolutely. So the good news at SCAD Pro, we can do anything. We can do mm -hmm. digital, physical, fidgetal, uh, especially with over 100 different majors and minors and a diverse student population from 120 countries in 50 states. 
So I like this one. I ask this question all the time. So Alan, I'm going to ask you, have you ever been through a Chick-fil-A drive-thru? I have, yes. <laughs> that was a SCAD Pro project. So wow. that's a perfect example of where we use design thinking to solve problems. And the worst thing about design thinking is that the word design is in the title. You know, you can use design to solve anything in terms of organization, process, structure, even government services as well. So as you think about that flow through Chick-fil-A, the orchestration of the cars, the setup, the lanes, the iPad experience, Chick-fil-A came to us several years ago and said, hey, can we rethink our outdoor dining experience and what would that look like? Mm -hmm. uh, so we love to talk about that one because it's very tangible. Most people have been through a Chick-fil-A drive through and can understand, oh, I, under I get it. And if you compare that to other types of drive throughs that are out there. The other ones are pretty horrific when you compare it to a Chick-fil-A, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but you know, it's not only about Chick-fil-A. We like to talk about Deloitte as well, too, which is our largest client. And they've found value in our partnership since 2019, and really tackling some of the most complex issues out there facing public sector organizations, public housing, welfare, social security, space launches. These are big, meaty, complex problems that students are solving through design and design thinking. We've done over 25 projects with Deloitte. They've hired over 30 students directly into their company, which all goes back to supporting our mission, like I said, which is preparing students for their creative profession. I'll give you one more. I mean, most recently, we partnered with America's foremost luxury jewelry brand, David Yerman, to mm. execute their holiday campaign, Create Joy, Give David Yerman. So if you go to their homepage right now, you'll see a big, beautiful video that we shot on our LED volume stage in Savannah. The brand turned to SCAD Pro to create the brand's first virtual production project. Uh, so we're really proud of that. You'll see it on TV. You'll see it in social campaigns. You'll see it online. That's just the breadth and depth of what we do. But like I've said, we've done over 700 partnerships to date. Uh, and the David Yerman one is one we're really proud of. No, I, I love all of those examples. And it shows the breadth and depth of how design and design thinking approaches. And I, I agree with you. It, like it, the only problem with that word is design is in the title. But like, how do you innovate, frankly, around various challenges that the business has. And um, is that, in your words, I mean, this isn't really something we discussed before, but like, if it wasn't called design thinking, would it just be called innovation? Yeah, I think it would be called innovation because yeah, innovation is one of the most abused words in the corporate lexicon right now. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and innovation is not about taking it to the press or taking it to the board. Innovation is really about an eyes wide open moment. It's about creating a magic moment for the user. If you're taking it to the press or to the board, you're serving the wrong customer. When you create that aha moment for the user and you're user testing and you're changing their behavior or making something better for them, that's innovation at the end of the day. And you know, this is something we'll talk about in a little while as well, but that's where companies need to get it right, is that it's not necessarily about the press. It's really about what are you doing for your customer at the end of the day? How are you listening to your customers and how are you serving your customer? Who doesn't want to know about their customer? in these large companies as well, too. And you know, that's key in terms of getting design integrated into the top ranks of a business. Yeah. Well, uh, tell me a little bit more about that. Like, uh, you've done this, not only for the clients that you're serving at SCAD Pro, but with Home Depot and all of the various other places that you've served in your career, leading design teams. How do you think about driving design and integrating it into how the business thinks and how the business leaders run? Sure. If it's not integrated, then the design process is probably not fully understood or the business value has not been clearly articulated to leadership or key stakeholders within a company. As designers and creatives, we have to be able to talk the language of business. In other words, show the math. And math was never really my strong suit, but I've been forced to learn that to be able to get, <laughs> to get buy in. And if you're known as the team that makes t-shirts and logos, you're, you're already in the hole. You've already got a problem. So by speaking in the language that leaders care about, and how it affects bottom line, it becomes a much different conversation where you can get buy-in and support. So the work has to really connect back to some KPI, some investment, a broader strategy and not be done in a vacuum. So as design leaders, we have to be inclusive of our business partners, IT, supply chain, operations, marketing, and even legal. Yes, you can have legal in the room too and have the right people to make sure that they have skin in the game. So you're not expecting them to draw like we were saying about design thinking. It's not about beautiful sketches. It's really about problem solving. And you're looking for diverse perspectives and in creating interdependence in problems that need to be solved. So by making it an interdependent team sport and involving more people in the design process and making it less of a black box, you're starting to show other people the true deep value of design and how it really works. We're not just off in a corner drawing pictures of a spirit animal wearing a beret. <laughs> it was great great visual great visual um, as you think about i mean is it 
what are maybe the ingredients, if you will, that go into creating this opportunity? Like it, it feels like there has to be some level of openness at the outset, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, there, there's going to be a level of corporate obstructionism that you're going to run into or a whole level line of, of leaders that either need to retire or get out of the way. But you really have to find like-minded people. You have to find those entrepreneurs and other leaders with fortitude that really want to push freedom and the innovation that is necessary in organizations that sometimes it's just not authorized. So I've spent a good portion of my career pushing design to a strategic level. And I've really found that the ingredients necessary to provide that value are one, being inclusive. One of the most mm -hmm. powerful parts of design thinking is that it brings everyone to the table on a project, like I was mentioning earlier, it's having the right people in the room, creating empowerment. Design mm -hmm. teams have really, really have to become the guide and teacher to others. Uh, this puts the, the creative team in the center of the process, and that's value. So being able to go to other parts of the organization and teach people how to be creative again is a huge tool and a huge leveraging chip for us to use. Uh, three, it can solve everything. Teams can work on the deeper problem. It's not just about digital design or output. It can be used for organization, processes, facilities, sales, internal events, and government services. Four, you know, Trojan horse or a secret weapon. If you really want to create real change, you have to change the way people think. And it's not just the way that they behave. And you know, a great example of this is when I was working at Home Depot, we took design thinking from a very grassroots level with the interconnected experience team all the way across the organization into HR, and then eventually running a facilitation with my executive leadership team. So no, no pressure. I've got my C-suite sitting in the room, and I'm telling my chief financial officer to push past the obvious. And he looks <laughs> up at me, and he's like, we should be working like this all the time. I said, I know. And so when you can make that type of change, that's huge. That's a win. And look, Home Depot is always going to be a merchant-led organization, full stop. It's not going to be a design-led organization ever. But to have that type of success of bringing design thinking to that level, that's really, really important. And finally, number five, you really have to be a bit of a pump. You know, if the word, if the word goes directly <laughs> towards creating the impact of a business leader talks about, then the conversation really becomes more grounded. It becomes depoliticized. And the teams and leaders become much more aligned. So like I said, the work has to map back to some investment. It just can't be done in a vacuum. And you have to have the fortitude to push through and create change. I love it. I love it. I mean, all of those elements, inclusivity, the empowerment, the, the fact that you can solve everything, you know, using it as a Trojan horse to create, create opportunities. And you have to be a little bit of a punk. <laughs> I mean, it goes back to your music days a little bit, to be honest. I don't know if you see the correlation or not, but it's, it's enlightening. I have to know, on your bio, there's this thing called Punks and Pinstripes Community that you're involved in. You have to, I mean, on the heels of talking about punk in general and as an ingredient to how you create an opportunity within business, what is Punks and Pinstripes? Yeah, uh, Punks and Pinstripes is it's a private network of entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and punks who have built and done things that are objectively badass and awesome. I was founded by my good friend and author, Greg Larkin. He wrote a book called This Might Get Me Fired. Uh, and it came out several years ago. And he and I met at the How Design Conference back in 2019 through a mutual friend. And he was doing a talk. I was doing a talk. I read his book and I was like, we're doing exactly the same thing at Home Depot. He was just using different language. And really the key to that is that we were corporate entrepreneurs or punks in terms of being a catalyst within the organization, the rebel in the boardroom. You know, mm -hmm. Change can't happen without us. You can't bring design thinking across an organization without having the fortitude and punk attitude of creating that change. So we like to think of ourselves as being able to push freedom and the innovation that is necessary in an organization where it's really authorized. And we look to each other to achieve, support, resolve, and as we spoke about earlier, I've spent a good portion of my career pushing design to a strategic level. And when we think about punks and pinstripes, some of our key themes include outcomes over output. You know, in a large company, it's easy to say no to an idea. No one risks anything when they say no to an idea. And you have to create these secret societies of like-minded people who are coming together because those who act alone are going to be fired and they're forgotten. So in some cases, that's going to be done publicly as well, too. So you have to build this entrepreneur underground within these big companies Find like-minded people who share your mindset and enlist them in the cause. And I have found that really the best teams have been this blend of missionaries and mercenaries. The missionaries laddering up into the big picture and the mission of the organization, but the mercenaries that are also rolling up their sleeves and getting the work done. And then finally, it's really finding that what we call executive evangelists or that godfather or godmother within the organization 
who believes in you and partners with you and understands innovation and will clear the path and will also take a bullet for you as well, too. They'll be your bulletproof vest in trying to create change within an organization. So in my current role, it's really about rallying the students into this type of missionary and mercenary. And I find this is the best blend of talent on teens when you really have people who fight for the company, but also roll up their sleeves and get things done. Yeah. No, I love I love the notions of missionaries and mercenaries and outcomes. You said outcomes over output. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, that's uh, that's fascinating and refreshing, to be honest. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it strips away all the BS. All the BS just kind of floats away. Yeah, exactly. It's like you're. It all depends on how much BS you're willing to put up with and what your threshold is within these large organizations. Like I said, mm-hmm. you're going to run into so many lines of corporate obstructionism somewhere politics, red tape, whatever it is, is just how much fortitude do you have to actually break through that and strengthen numbers with like-minded people? Yeah. It feels like to me some days, like you get more than three people in a room and it's the, it's an organizing principle to get to know. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) (laughs) No, I don't know why, but there's things that I've observed. It's when it gets above three that it automatically goes to know first. I don't know what that's about. Maybe I'll, I need to do a study about it. But anyway, aside, this has been a fascinating conversation. I love kind of the principles that you've laid out, the approaches, the work that you're doing at SCADPRO is amazing. One thing we like to do on this show is get to know you a little bit better. We know you've you've had this brush with fame uh, uh, early in your life. But I, the question I love asking everyone that comes on the show is, has there been an experience of your past that defines or makes up who you are today? Yeah, I think it's, it's a theme. And the theme for me is being unconventional in my career. And I've been called unconventional in different jobs. That's because creatives look at things differently. We're the kids that survive. And we have tremendous empathy, or I've pissed off a lot of people in my, in my journey as well, too. But if, if you're not pissing people off, then you're not innovating either. But I've led with empathy, and I genuinely care about the people on my teams. I've had large and small teams, but no matter the size, I could tell you something about each person beyond what they did for a living. I understood my team. And you have to put the time in, and simply put, you have to care about your people and their careers, especially now, post-pandemic after the great resignation, the great self-evaluation, quiet quitting, and the bigger desire to be cared for, recognized, and empowered. People don't care about free food, energy drinks in the refrigerator, cool furniture, swag, ping pong tables, or dog treats. That is not culture. Culture is a feeling. Culture is how your stomach feels on a Sunday night before you go back to work. So what people really want to feel is a human connection. And I think that's been a theme throughout my career, a sense of purpose. And now more than ever, it's important to keep team members engaged. They have to be healthy. They have to be connected. I call it life-work balance, not work-life. And that's how I've led my teams in the past. And that's how I do it today. I love it. I love that sentiment. And honestly, something else you said before, without knowing, truly knowing your people, it's really hard, I would imagine, to push past the obvious. You kind of have to know where they're coming from and know their, and know them to disrupt them, if that makes sense. Yeah, exactly. I mean, comfort is the enemy of greatness. And so you really have to push people outside of their comfort zone, but understand them as well, too. And what are those wants, needs, frustrations, behaviors, patterns that you can start to affinitize and bring together and say, oh, you know, that actually makes sense. We should pursue that. Great ideas come from everywhere. And so that goes back to that principle of having the right people in the room at the right time. It's about diverse perspectives, bringing people together and being inclusive. Well, what advice would you give your younger self if you're starting this all over again? (laughs) I love this question. Um, Really, if if I could go back in time and get out of my DeLorean, I'd probably say (laughs) the data will set you free. And I can recall many conversations early in my career before deep analytics and everything that we had to measure. I was having conversations with stakeholders and senior leadership about button color or making logos bigger, or or here's my favorite one, making it pop, of course. So (laughs) that's the one that makes us cringe the most. But I tell myself, remove the subjectivity, right? Bring it back to the user. Show how the work maps back to the bigger picture. Like I said earlier, show the math. So bringing that information, data, and research to the table helps really depoliticize the conversation, but also gets everybody on the same table. So you're not getting into this subjective world of I like and I don't like. That's the worst place to be in terms of any sort of creative review or review of a product. Well, as you think about marketers that are listening to this show, what do you, is there something you would suggest they learn more about, or maybe it's something you're trying to learn more about yourself? Yeah, I think for me, the trend is pretty clear and also shows in the type of 
work that we're doing at Scout Pro and why companies are coming to us. And they really want to tap into this Gen Z mindset. And as we think about social responsibility, ethics, and transparency, this all matters to the modern consumer. I was reading a study that 50% of Gen Zers and 40% of millennials want companies to take a stance on social issues. Mm. So when companies advocate for these issues, it has a strong impact on their purchase decisions. But the key to this, it has to be authentic or it's going right. to backfire. It really has to map back to the values of the organization and what it stands for. And those values have to be real. It just can't be words on a wall. And the first letter of each word can't spell another word. You know, it's like, it's really got to make sure that it stands for something and that it's authentic. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, right. So as you step back in, are there any trends or subcultures that you follow or you think other people should take notice of? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna double click on Gen Z again. I think yeah. you know the top companies are coming to us, and in some ways, is to teach them how to be creative again, but also to tap into that Gen Z mindset. As so, as we think about being hardworking, being entrepreneurial, uh, they're digital natives where everyone has a smartphone. Uh, growing up in far more diversity than previous generations, uh, they want employers to invest in them. They want to make a difference in the world. They value authenticity, like I said earlier, and they value financial independence. So right now, Gen Z is all about YouTube, Instagram, and TikTok. And so not only are they communicating with their friends and being entertained, but they're also discovering and buying products on social more than any other generation. And I don't think we, I don't think marketers should forget about SEO. SEO still matters. And a whopping 74% of Gen Z use their mobile phones most often when searching and shopping online, while 15% are just using a computer. So I you know, see SEO, SEO still matters. So I think this is something we need to pay attention to. Love it. Well, uh, last question for you. What do you think is the largest opportunity or threat facing marketers today? Yeah, we talked about this a little bit earlier. So you're not listening to your customers and understanding what innovation really means. It really has to be that aha moment and an eyes light up moment. And then, of course, there's AI and mm -hmm. using AI for better trend spotting and how might they use it as a companion species right now to make a smarter, more targeted ad. You know, the AI is a little bit of the Wild West right now. We really haven't had that iPhone moment that really brings everybody together to, into one space. Say, okay, this is the path forward or this is the way. Uh, we don't know what that is right now, but it's going to make a huge impact in many industries within the next few years. I think we all know that. But as we think about marketers, we really have to be ready to reap the benefits of AI technology, uh, creating smarter, more targeted ads, uh, accurate trend spotting and predictions, better understanding of buyer behavior. Uh, increased customer retention and loyalty. All of these things are coming. It's just what's that thing we're going to rally around and say, okay, that is the way, that is the path forward, that is the tool we're going to use. Love it. I love it. Well, Paul, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, my pleasure, Alan. Thank you so much. It was a fun conversation. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with post-production support from Sam Robertson. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com. Tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love hearing from listeners. You can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes and links to what was discussed in the episode today, and you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is...